This is Musings of the Shibe Podcast. I'm your host, Hiroja Shibe. Hiroja Shibe here with another episode of Musings of the Shibe Podcast. This is a bit different. This episode is just some random news that I had cut off of the previous episodes. A bit of relevant news to cryptocurrency space, but um, technology in general. And it's just basically what it is, is um, just kind of give us a cushion, a breather after uh, doing the minor uh, week of episodes, uh, right before we get to like the really nitty gritty about the different types of solutions that are being proposed, uh, whether it be uh, Bitcoin Unlimited, Segregated Witness, a uh, user activated segregated witness block uh block i think it's called block extensions and uh mumble mumble wimble i think it's what it is uh just basically all the various solutions that have been proposed to address the uh block size even the uh keeping the block size as is uh there's a lot of people that just want to keep it at the mega one megabyte and we'll t- speak upon that as well but we're about to head head into some really very dry, very technical aspects of this debate. And we're gonna I'm gonna present each of the different solutions and then basically coalesce um all the things that we talked about from the philosophy um that brought people into Bitcoin, the different uh players, you know, the businesses, the uh miners. Um we're gonna do a user episode a little bit, uh the developers, the core developers, and all the d- different warring parties if you will, and just kind of wrap things up. But before we get into that, before we get to like the really technical aspects, uh, here's just some random news to kind of give you a breather before we head into all that. So the news. Uh, Mt. Gox, because of the increased value of Bitcoin, which is trading now around 1800 per coin, um, they do have some Bitcoin that they're holding. Um, that value some people think or perceive as a talk of Mt. Gox, uh, they might be reaching close to the value of what people have lost as creditors, and that might be a chance for some people to receive some of their funds back. And there's a kind of discussion going around on that particular issue, considering that right now um, the value of Bitcoin itself is exceeding um, the, the price before, slightly after Mt. Gox has um, crashed. So I have a link in the show notes uh, to that bit of a discussion. Whether or not that will happen, it all depends on, you know, the creditors and the lawsuits that are going on, and particularly how uh, Japan, which has receivership over that and control over that particular court case, views all this. Most people are sticking to the fact that they actually want their Bitcoin. They've substantially lost a significant amount of Bitcoin, and they don't want fiat or fiat value at the time of the crash. They actually want their Bitcoin back. It's just an interesting discussion in general. Hyperbad's human library treats humans as books that can be borrowed for 30 minutes. This is from scroll.in. Um, uh, the concept is based on the age-old idea of knowledge sharing. Articles by Alice Shamar. What can be seen as an ingenious idea, a few people in the Hyperbad have come up with a human library in which you borrow humans. While you want to read a book to understand a concept, but someone can sit down and explain it to you. The concept is based on the old age idea of sharing of knowledge sharing. The brainchild, brainchild of Harshid Fahd, a student of mass media and communication at the Annapurna University in Hyderabad. The library has been functioning for less than a month. Fahd said that the first human library event in India was held at Indore in 2016 at the IM Indore campus. Hyderabad is the second city to initiate this project, and we are getting ready for our next event on April 22nd. The concept of human library was first introduced in Denmark in the year 2000, when Roni Abuja, along with his brother and colleagues, all part of a youth movement named Stop the Violence, nurtured this concept. The aim was to utilize human books and the human experience. Ever since, Australia has become the first country to have a permanent human library. Hmm, interesting. Uh, Thad, along with his friends from college, organized human library events. The aim of these events is to let people choose from the various categories of human books available. Once you've chosen your book, you get to have an in- intimate chat with more than with them for 30 minutes. Anybody can be a book as long as they have an interesting experience and stories to share fit into the category provided by Thad. At their debut in March 2017, 10 human books were available. The number of books are expected to double at the next event. Talking about his favorite book, Thad said about that about all the books that he managed to collect so far, Surviving Domestic Violence and Self-Loathing Narcissists are my favorite human books as they fill 
They say instill courage and to deter the strangers in you. Sharing stories can be emotionally overwhelming for narrators. After each reading session, we ask the human books how they feel and if they are emotionally equipped to share more. In a reading time of 30 minutes, not only can you listen to the experience, but you can also ask questions, making it a thoroughly interactive session. Sharing his experience with human book Evie Silver, an LGBTQ activist who can also identify as gay, said, narrating personal stories of my life to random people was a tad unnerving, yet it also is a learning experience of narrating it differently, especially when I was aware that the particular reader stayed back to listen to my story for a second time. He went on to add how his identity serves an additional purpose. I was aware that I was offering a singular experience of the gay slash lesbian lives and giving my readers a peek into those similar as well different points of view which shape our thought and experience. What's the most encouraging about the human library that is that it allows the readers a space to directly confront their prejudices by choosing a separate subject that they don't understand. Through listening to the experience of the books, the reader is able to connect to the subject in a deeply personal way because these books say a lot more inside than their cover outside, and there's no pin drop silence. That's fascinating. I'm then going to dig more into that. I find that very fascinating, this concept of human dispensers of knowledge. Airbnb, home away, settle S SF suit, agreed to register all local hosts. Uh, this is from the San Francisco Gate by Carolyn Seed. Of the... You know, sharing economy or quote unquote sharing economy businesses out there. Aaron B has it been a tidbit better to say something somebody like Uber, but they have a ways to go. I mean, they have significant issues within themselves. But as far as dispensing, I would say profits, if you will, um, they have a better and stronger relationship with their hosts than versus um, Uber when it comes to their drivers. Um, I personally think Airbnb could be much better, but we'll save that for another time when we talk about. I think I'll, I think I will do a, a Hiroshi thought bubble um, about Airbnb um, sometime down the road. But I also will talk about just overall the sharing economy when we talk about Uber, about the issues I have with these companies that pro proclaim themselves to be sharing economy, if you will. So Airbnb and HomeAway settled a lawsuit against San Francisco Monday by agreeing to help the city and ensure that all local hosts are registered. The agreement caps a multi-year struggle by Airbnb home hometown to rein in its burgeoning vacation rentals, which critics say divert precious housing stock into a lucrative travel market. The two largest vacation re rental services will, all, will only include legal listing, listings, and the city has tools for quick, effective enforcement. City Attorney Dennis Harris says the crowded news conference in City Hall. He was flanked by lawmakers and representatives of groups that say short-term rentals hurt them, including landlords, hotel worker unions, and tenant about activists. Uh, enforcement with real teeth will begin in short order after a phase-in period. San Francisco law required vacation rental hosts to register with the city took effect in February 2015. Only about 2,100 out of 8,000 hosts on Airbnb have done so. San Francisco wants properties registered so they can ensure that the city that they meet city rules that aim to prevent illegal hotels and homes, such as requiring vacation rentals to be permanent residents, and capping whole home rentals at 90 days. Airbnb later joined by rival HomeAway sued San Francisco in federal court in June after supervisors unanimously passed legislation holding company liable for steep fines and criminal penalties if they arrange guest stays at unregistered properties. Airbnb and HomeAway said that the law violated their rights under the Communication Decency Act, a federal law that largely shields internet service providers from legal responsibility for the content they're posting on their sites in the First Amendment. The U.S. District Judge James Dalton appeared highly skeptical of these arguments at the court hearing in the fall. In November, he ordered San Francisco and Airbnb to work together on a system for companies to comply with the law by registering their hosts. The, the agreement will allow hosts to comply with San Francisco law with simplicity and sharing of visibility, says Chris Neiman, Airbnb's head of global public policy in a conference call with reporters. We want to move on and talk about other things. Those other things probably include preparing for public offering on Wall Street. Airbnb is one of the most valuable startups, but ongoing regulatory disputes could threaten the $31 billion value investors have placed on it in a private fundraising. Liam took, play, took pains on Monday to call to emphasize that Airbnb is increasingly forging agreements with cities worldwide. City officials, including Major Ed, Mayor Ed Lee, help he praise on the agreement. This is a divisive victory for San Francisco. The supervisor Aaron Pixson described Airbnb as being dragged, kicking, and screaming to the negotiating table. 
We demand a system to prevent landlords taking entire units off the market, said Lynn Breed, Board of Supervisors President. I'm thrilled the companies have agreed to abide by sensible regulation. And then the article kind of goes on. So just like Uber is facing regulatory issues, Airbnb is facing the same thing. And I think it's important, particularly when it comes to housing, because San Francisco it has already an extremely tight market as it is. It does, unfortunately, disproportionately affect pe- people of lower income. When you pull these um, units out of the market, it drives up rental, prop- you know, rent up and things of that nature. And it just skews the market, if you will. So one coin is this scam, a very obvious scam that people have been talking about. But now there's some legal action occurring. This comes from Merkle.com. OneCoin sends lawsuit threats to media and whistleblowers. Um, This is a typical thing that scammers do. OneCoin has been a controversial topic in the cryptocurrency community. After a recent arrest in Mumbai, which resulted in 18 OneCoin representatives arrested in $3 million seized, it seems the scheme is starting starting to issue legal threats to publications and writers. One such person to receive a legal threat was Bajam Burkek, a blockchain professional from Norway. The cease and desist letter threatened to sue Burchick unless he withdrew his statements, YouTube videos, and articles. Uh, article is written by Mark. According to Burjohn Burchick, one coin recruitment company approached him on the 29th of September 2016. He told Behind ML that the Asina approached him regarding a C level position. We're currently working on a C level search that may interest you. Could you suggest? When you may be free for a call and the best number to reach you on. The annual salary for such a position was $2.5 million. However, once BG realized that he would be working with OneCoin, he turned down the position. In the process of listening to all the details of the, the job, the blockchain professional realized that Bitcoin was u- uh, the OneCoin was using a simple SQL database to store the tokens. It didn't take long for him to realize the, import- the information to the public. According to Behind MLM, There are talks that OneCoin did hire an actual blockchain developer to set up a ledger for the company. However, it still doesn't change the fact that there wasn't a blockchain to begin with. Uh, Birgit wasn't the only one to receive threatening letters. A Bitcoin journalist from Germany written for CoinSpondent also received a legal threat from OneCoin. And according to Friedman uh, Bernas, the journalist in question, OneCoin lawyers were irritated by an article he published. In the article, Birgit pointed out that two publications by Boffin, the German banking watchdog, which criticized one coin. After a wave of legal threats were sent, most of the users on the receiving end decided to retract their statements or remove the content. However, a few decided to stand up to one coin and fight them in court if it gets to that point. It's still unclear whether or not any of the journalists will actually be sued as they only received threats of litigation so far. Unfortunately, since one coin is quite a large organization, they have a large legal fund. While one coin may not be able to win the liable and defamation cases, it can still use stall tactics to bleed the defendants dry. This is a common strategy used by entities with large sums of cash to make others with less resources comply. Only time will tell whether OneCoin threats are legitimate or not. However, so far we haven't seen any liable suits filed by OneCoin lawyers. So there's been some arrests, there's been some legal progress. It's just that I think the clock is ticking. It's a matter of time before a lot of the players are going to be... um, round it up, if you will, um, face trial, but I don't think a lot of people are going to get their money back, to be honest. So a little update on uh, some concepts we talked about during the Silk Road uh, Marketplace, particularly OTC, and this something I never even heard of called dark pools. But OTC, which is um, off-chain uh, transactions, those off-chain transactions that people, some people are a little bit upset about, but... Here we go. This is from the Merkle by JP Buntix. Everyone involved in cryptocurrency is well aware how their investors should control the market. Their so-called whales do not rely on buying Bitcoin through traditional means, though instead they use a different method such as OTC trading, the dark pools. Both types of trading are designed to appeal to cryptocurrency whales, although both types of trading require a significantly different approach. When cryptocurrency whales are looking to buy and sell Bitcoin, they, they will not use their regular exchange order books like most of us do. Instead, they will use an OTC markets, which are much larger and represent far more volume compared to traditional exchanges. Wealthy people want convenient, convenient access to Bitcoin and other prominent cryptocurrencies, and OTC trading is their go-to solution. The main reason for the shift to OTC trading is how regular exchanges cannot provide ample 
liquidity to accommodate the needs of cryptocurrency whales. Any trade above US uh, 1 million will attract a lot of attention and send a massive signal to the rest of the Bitcoin trading community. As it is not in the whale's best interest to alert others about whether they plan to buy or sell Bitcoin at, at what price. One of the questions that remain is where these OTC markets can be found. We highlighted some of the possibilities in the previous article, although there are a lot of other companies out there providing such services. Ipit is by far one of the most popular Bitcoin OTC trading platforms, and Binary Financial is high up on the list as well. Although we highlighted the concept of a Bitcoin dark pool in a separate article a few weeks ago, a lot of people still remain unaware of dark pools. Like, I, I've never heard of it, of it until this particular article. There are quite a few of these trading platforms around, or even prominent ex Bitcoin exchanges run their own dark pool at the time. Uh, Kraken is perhaps the biggest exchange in the Western world to provide such a service. The primary use case of dark pool is to find enough trading liquidity on exchange without the disrupt disrupting the regular order book. Placing multiple million dollar orders on the Kraken exchange would cause a widespread panic among both buyers and sellers alike. Using a dark pool, however, those trades will have no impact on the regular book orders while still being conducted through the exchange in question. One thing traders need to be wary about is how the concept of dark pools is scrutinized by financial regulators. Financial institutions and banks using similar trading platforms have been penalized for unlawful trading activities. Even though these offerings are designed to stabilize markets at a reduced cost, they remain somewhat of a thorn to the side of regulators all over the world. So these are kind of like off the book trading, I guess, with already existing um, exchange systems, if you will. And lastly, encrypted chat. Um, this is a Wired article by Lily Hay Newman. I think I want to look more into that dark pool concept. That just seems very interesting, and I'm not sure if it completely follows under the ethos of the Bitcoin. Our cryptocurrency system. I mean, everything is supposed to be like public and visible and seen. Um, it, there's such an emphasis on transparency, but at the same time, it clashes with the concept of privacy. But anyways, encrypted chat took over. Let's encrypt calls too. As in and in encrypted message apps have exploded in popularity, several well-known services have added encrypted calls as well. Why not, right? If it works for tech-based chats, voice seems like a natural extension. If only it were that easy. Encrypted calls have plenty of value in keeping conversations strictly between the two parties. They can circumvent government wiretaps or criminal snooping. But a host of technical challenges will facilitate the calls themselves, have slowed the spread of a voice over internet protocol voice over internet protocol overall. Bandwidth is expensive. Firewalls and network filters make it harder to route data streams. Even basic call quality issues like delays and echoes prove difficult to fix. Adding encryption on top of all it, it takes additional resources and specialized developers. All of which has delayed encrypted calling but not stopped it, and a new groundswell enthusiasm is bringing more options than ever. Dropped calls. The challenges of making reliable encrypted calls starts with the underlying premise of internet-based calls. They're hard. While VOP calling has become more reliable over the years, it remains technically challenging in itself especially when people use cellular, cellular data instead of the more stable Ethernet or Wi-Fi connections. Despite these challenges, Signal, the well-regarded secure communication platform, has offered encrypted calling since 2014 and has message app Wire. And when WhatsApp followed in 2016, bringing encrypted calls and video chat to more than a billion users, it helped shake off some long-standing inertia. Other secure message apps like Telegram have added encrypted calling over the last year. Signal itself even rolled out the quality call quality improvements in February. Single developer Open Whisper system open source its code so the companies can borrow from it to build their own encrypted chat and calling features. For example, while WhatsApp's overall setup is proprietary, it bases, it bases the key exchange for its end-to-end -end encrypted messages and calls on Signal protocol. The users have a trust that it is implementing true end-to-end -end encryption in the way it claims. In exchange, it brings some form of end-to-end -end encryption to the enormous user base that would probably otherwise have little exposure to or protection from the feature. And customers who don't have faith in a large provider like WhatsApp now have the option of giving the recent proliferation of both VOP in general and encryption, encryption specifically. So I think this is very good. I think the way um, security measures are going and the fact that you know, there's a, another round of building in backdoors or being forced to build in backdoors into encryption, that these type of systems are out there, that they're open source, and in fact, more importantly, that it might not even be possible for 
backdoor systems to come to existence now because if you put the code out there and then anyone can create and fork and build off of it. There's so much happening right now in the space, which is really exciting, says Nathan Ferdis, for the, the founder and director of the Guardian Project, a privacy and security nonprofit that worked on an encrypted, encrypted calling platform called Open Secure Telephone Network. In 2012, there was just Skype, basically. Google Hangouts didn't even exist. FaceTimes existed kind of, so we're really happy when there's so much public innovation that includes privacy and security, though not nearly as much as there could be if everyone can get on the same page. And then the article kind of goes on and talks about closed networks. Uh, the One Man Supreme Court Bit License Battle begins in two weeks uh, by Jamie Redman. This came out April 21st. This past March, Bitcoin.com reported on a single Bitcoin entrepreneur taking the New York Bit license to court due to the law stifling digital currency businesses and constraining regulations set forth by the New York Division of Financial Services, or NYDFS. Now, the French national Theo Chino is taking the case to the Supreme Court with his first hearing beginning on May 4th. So we probably should sometime next week hear some kind of outline about this. One Bitcoin entrepreneur takes on the NYDFS. The New York Bit license has always been a contentious subject for Bitcoiners ever since the former Regulator Ben Logaski introduced legislation. Since the doves, since then, droves of Bitcoin-focused businesses left New York to operate el- elsewhere, and only a few companies have been approved under the license. Following these events, Theo Chino, a businessman who operated the Bit- Bitcoin Merchant Solution Service, said his business is hurt by the Bit licenses, and he's been concentrating all his energy towards fighting the regulatory guidelines. Chino believes the reason behind the Bit licenses is unclear, inconsistent, but still led to, to the cons- commencement of legislative action. The lawsuit called Article 78, which was filed in New York's highest court, states that the court should allow for limited discovery on the economic nature of Bitcoin and whether the, whether the regulation was issued in an arbitrary and capricious fashion. Looking for Bitcoin Foundation assistance, Chino also uh, complained in the past about the Bitcoin Foundation not doing enough to assist fighting this legal battle. During the recent Bitcoin conference in Miami, Chino interrupted the former Bitcoin Foundation director, Bruce Fitton's keynote speech and asked him why the foundation wasn't helping him. Fitton replied that the foundation can only do so much with volunteer efforts and the organization did lobby the NYDFS alongside groups like Electronic Frontier Foundation. Bitcoin Foundation begins fundraising for Chino's legal costs. While the hearing is coming soon, the Bitcoin Foundation has since pledged on April 10th to solicit donations to help the trial move forward. In a recent blog post, the organization states that bid licenses can, st- can still be stopped if we use this opportunity, referring to the Chino Supreme Court case. Our final opportunity is to get the New York Bit license regulation thrown out and support the only legal challenge against it filed by Theo Chino, a Bitcoin entrepreneur and lifetime member of the Bitcoin Foundation, explaining that the organization's recent blog post. Chino and his attorney, Pierre Circa, intended to pursue the challenge over the long haul, almost certainly all the way to the New York's highest court. The Bitcoin Foundation says they have created a BTC wallet to accept donations for Chino's legal fees. The foundation will disperse amounts from his wallet on the, on the presentation of invoices for legal fees, Occurring the matter and signed off by Chino, the Bitcoin Foundation explained. The organization hopes to raise one hundred to two hundred thousand dollars in Bitcoin to help with all the legal costs. With May fourth approaching fast, the foundation has raised only a small portion of the funds so far at the donated wallet and has collected a little over eight hundred dollars. The hearing will take place at the Justice Lucy's building in New York City. Chino hopes for stopping the bait license from causing any further energy damage. Um, I'm not surprised that the Bitcoin Foundation has not been able to raise the funds, given its checkered history and past, particularly when dealing with uh, previous funds given to the foundation in itself. But I'm also a little surprised that the community hasn't rallied around uh, this particular case. It's kind of been a bit of a bit uh, discerning and an issue for me personally, where we see these court cases, and there's not been an effort by either prominent or reasonable uh, people within the community to donate and pay for the legal costs. Like, for example, a couple of cases when individuals um, had had literally stings put on them and had to plea out their cases when it came to selling uh, Bitcoin uh, peer-to-peer without a monetary license and not to, for the community not to have challenged this particular legal case. I think we should be challenging all these legal cases, whether we get a good outcome or not, to put forth into uh, the court system so that this is being discussed, is being bantered around, because that's the only way we can possibly achieve either a better regulation, uh, either no regulation, or some kind of a legal outcome that puts the government as far away from cryptocurrency as possible.
Well, here's a follow up on a on a privacy cash story. Follow up, a follow up, if you will. The Zcash advisor research on Monero link linkability refuted by Monero community by Joseph Young, this from BTC, BTC manager. On April 13th, Zcash advisor and assistant director of IC3 Andrew Miller stated that transactions on the Monero blockchain from 2014 through 2016 could be linked. To begin with, Monero users decoy links called mixins to obscure inputs and outputs of transactions. Such process anonymizes Monero's transactions as it disables users from following traces of a transaction to its origin, unlike Bitcoin. However, in a research paper entitled an Empirical Analysis of Linkability to the Monero Blockchain, written by Miller and his team of researchers, including uh, Malt Moser, Kevin Lee, and um, Arvin Narnan, Miller claimed the mixins of Monero do not execute properly prior to February 2017. We showed that the fact that most of the Monero's blockchain history, the mixins haven't done much good. Most transactions made prior to February 2017 actually are linkable. Here's the problem. In the past, most coins were spent by zero mix-in transactions. Those that opt out of privacy altogether were commonplace, including those coins as decoys don't do any good, because it's already obvious where they actually been spent. However, the Monero wallet doesn't, does take into account the result is that we're able to identify the correct links of majority, 63% of one plus mix-in. Monero transactions made from 2014 through 2016. The Monero blockchain has provided a little more privacy than Bitcoin, Miller explained. The response of the Monero development team. Almost immediately after the release of Miller's research, Monero lead, direct, lead developer Ricardo Spaghini, better known as Fluffy Pony, admitted, immediately explained that the issue addressed in the research paper, paper was well understood problem with both the Monero development team and the community. In that sense, the research, research paper wasn't inaccurate, but Fluffy Pony explained that the research paper was falsely presented as the Monero a denominization paper. Fluffy went on as far as to accuse the president of the Seacouch Foundation of initiating a pay for hit piece against his competitor Monero. Uh, the problem is not the paper, said Fluffy Pony. The problem is that it presented a Monero denominization paper released an hour before a hard fork and even lauded itself by one of the authors of the new research series and many weaknesses in privacy centric cryptocurrency Monero. 80% of the transactions linkable is not a new research, it's additional research on a problem that is well understood. 80% of transactions are not traceable. It wasn't researchers trying to improve the ecosystem. It was a paid-for-hit piece by the president of the Zcash Foundation, he added. Simply put, according to the Monero development team, the issue with Miller's research is that it addresses a problem which was introduced long before Miller's discovery. The community criticized Miller's research due to the team's utilization of centralization title link or reference to an outdated paper. Specifically, the timing of the release of Miller's research was quite odd, as it was based on an old research paper of which the community was already fully aware. The Monero community particularly criticized Naryong's statement in which he described Miller's research as an exploitation of Monero's anonymity and privacy features. Naryong wrote the new, new research serious anonymity weaknesses and private centric cryptocurrencies in Monero, 80% of the transactions linkable. Moreover, an unofficial response to the Monero community to Miller's research addressed the technical issues of the paper. In court of the response, the linkable transactions from 2014 to 2016 should not have come across as a surprise to most users as they were disclosed pool payouts. We believe that a large portion of the zero mix-in transactions are pool payouts. Those transactions should come to no one's surprise that they are traceable since the pools themselves publish the payment amount to each address. Thus, we believe that the claims stemming from the tra traceability transactions before zero mix-in transactions were banned to be misplaced, uh, the response read. Monero utilizes a technology called Ring CT, which was invented by the Monero development team to use Bitcoin Core developer Greg Maxwell's confidential transaction together with Monero's Ring signatures to hide all amounts of Monero transaction. Overall, while Miller's research was not factually inaccurate, it falsely portrayed Monero's and its technology by stating that Monero's transactions were de uh, anonymized when they were not. So there was that bit of a spat. Um, Again, this will be interesting to see how all these privacy caches play out, particularly when, if, you know, Bitcoin were ever to incorporate any kind of privacy measures into its um, overall code. But for now, as things are progressing, it seems that these, pri um, these privacy caches, as they refine themselves, get better, and start beginning to be adopted for payment usage, you're going to start seeing, um, I think, more and more adoption in usage of uh, these type of coins. So Spell of Genesis is a um, card tricking platform that's built off the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, we've spoken about them in the past. They have these very gorgeous cards that um, 
are reflective of what's going on um, within the cryptocurrency space, but are owed to either creators or coins or what's going on. And um, it's a whole entire MMO and trading game platform that's going on. They've been going on for about two years. They have their own in-game currency. Uh, they're basically, excuse me, a, a, a strong usage case of what you could do with the blockchain technology. And now they are on the um, Android and uh, Apple Android and uh, Apple Store platform, the iOSs. So this comes from Bitcoin News. Uh, Spell of Genesis, a blockchain-based mobile game, was released on the Apple App Store and Google Play Store yesterday. Uh, Spell of Genesis is in app stores. Uh, the blockchain-based fantasy trade game uh, has been released. Uh, this means the cryptocurrency is one step closer to mainstream adoption as anyone with an iOS or Android device can now play the game. Uh, Shaban Shane, the CEO and founder of Everdream Soft, stated that it's a huge milestone because SOG be one of the first ICO projects to hit the mainstream market. The news comes 18 months after the initial coin offering campaign in which uh, the Swiss-based Everdream Soft, the company behind SOG, collected 934 BTC in exchange for Bit Crystal, Bit, Bit Crystals as their uh, game currency or token, a crypto asset issued on the Bitcoin blockchain. The BCY is used to purchase in-game content and unlock uncertain certain unlock certain features. Knowing this, SOG offering gamers the ability to actually own their in-game balance and exchange it for BC, BTC or other currency in fiat, they're also leveraging blockchain technology to bring life the concept of rare trading cards. Uh, the Bitcoin blockchain ensures that BTC can now be reproduced, forged, or duplicated, just like in, it ensures that SOG rare trading cards cannot. This is also done by, using, by issuing the trading cards as assets on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, this is great because, you know, um, <clears throat> forgery with physical coins, uh, physical cards happens all the time. Um, digital assets get forged all the time. There's uh, the, the concept of actually owning things you might earn or gain or like rare um, is an issue with a lot of games because people wanted to trade or sell them. And there, for a period of time, especially in the early aughts, that was possible. But now that's closed, a lot of games prevent that. There's also a lot of laws that prevent some of that from happening. But with this, this is completely different. This allows for users that they actually, you know, for example, World of Warcraft, get that uh, rare sword that there's only like, I don't know, a thousand in existence, if you will. Then they can actually trade or leverage that and, and get some kind of fiat or other assets for. Uh, a lot of games, you know, because they know people are trading, they have trading platforms within. But even then, it's still kind of game and there's bots and there's all sorts of issues. But with Spell of Genesis, it's, it's much different because it's built on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, you're not going to see duplication and you're going to see less fraud action occurring. And I'm not quite sure if, there, if it is possible to mine for gold like it occurs with some um, uh, multi, you know, those multiplayer games that are out there. But so far, I haven't heard anything uh, significantly negative about uh, Spells of Genesis. Other than the fact that some people don't, just don't think as a platform it's going to work that people aren't going to be interested in, which is really not the case. I think they just kind of underestimate the whole um, or don't understand the whole uh, trading and gaming platform that exists out there. Uh, Spell of Genesis is a mobile game that brings the elements of trading ga card games, TCGs, along with an arcade style gaming aspect. Uh, SOG is influenced by blockchain technology on various levels. Not only are uh, bit crystals used to monetize the game, rare trading cards are also cryptographic assets on the Bitcoin blockchain. But that's not all. The blockchain technology is also, is also the main focus of the storyline, with rare cards featuring known coins, services people like Satoshi Nakamoto card, an Ethereum card, and even a fork card to symbolize the current uh, Bitcoin scaling debate. Kind of skipping around here. Despite being one of the first ICO projects to reach a mainstream audience, BitCrystal is not the only cryptocurrency and gaming project out there. In fact, there's two that seem to form a perfect match, starting with gambling. Bitcoin changed, changed the way we interact with online, ca online casinos, making online gambling transparent much more efficient. And today, there are multiple probable fair uh, gambling websites. On online gaming itself, I've also been limited in the sense that all the accomplish accomplishment of gamers was something more than data in a server, which they could never export in the real world. And thanks to blockchain technology, users can be rewarded for their efforts of trading in-game items and cards for actual money. And it just kind of continues on. I think it's, it's great. Um, we'll see, you know, um, how things progress. They just launched um, this in April. This is May, March. So I would I think we'll check in with them around mid-July and see how things have progressed so far. <clears throat> Two things. Uh, Segwit has activated on the Light, uh, Litecoin. 
And another thing is that there is a, I think it's a little bit higher now. Um, I believe it's 275. LTC is up for grabs in a Litecoin SegWit crypto puzzle that was published by Charlie Wee. It hasn't yet been solved as a recording of this uh, broadcast. Uh, it's a, uh, it's hard to describe. It's a, a Litecoin uh, coin, if you will, a picture or diagram of it, if you will. Um, it's very well done and within it, are clues and keys to understand how to uh, gain the private key to do an access a private address. So I have a link in the show notes to that. So there's two news um, about Dogecoin and they're not quite good, uh, depending on your mindset. Um, Cripsy, which was a an exchange in a wallet, if you had um, an account with them, you have to May 18th, not May 18th, but um, May 17th, to file a claim with them to see if you can get back your uh, coins. Uh, there, there's a, there was a class action lawsuit and there was a settlement reach. I have a link in the show notes for that for you to per- peruse for yourself. So there's a time crunch, if you will, on that. Uh, the Dogecoin tip bot, and I think we'll do an episode after we do the block, chi- block uh, size debate. We'll talk about the status of Dogecoin, but the Doge Tipbot is out of commission. It's shut down. Um, the creator, Mulan, has uh, basically uh, taken the coins to pay bills um, concerning it. There is, um, you can uh, submit a claim request to him to get, uh, perhaps get your coins back if you will. Um, there's a link um, at the top of the Dogecoin subreddit. There's also a link here um, in the show notes about it. I'm going to read this article, but it's just it's just kind of a sad state of where we are with within the Dogecoin community right now. Um, this article is from Gizmodo. Reddit users lose real money after meme currency bot dies. Uh, Peter Yu is a writer. Another day, another cryptocurrency clusterfuck. This week, the creator of the tip bot, Doge tip bot, a uh, service that let Reddit users tip each other. And Dogecoin announced that his company is broke. He's broke and the bot is broke because he spent all the coins after he himself ran out of money. Uh, the Dogecoin was usually conceived as a joke featuring a popular Shin- Shibinu Do- Doge meme, um, which is kind of summarizing the history of Dogecoin. So I'm kind of going down here. Uh, in 2014, the creator of, Toad- of the Doge tip bot, uh, Josh Mulan, told Money and Tech that his bot was the most popular cryptocurrency tipping service on the internet. At that point, according to Mulan, 56,000 Reddit users had traded the equivalent of $150,000 in Dogecoin tips. Later that year, uh, Mulan decided that the free service Doge bot offered was a feasible business. He set up a company named Wow Such Business Incorporated to run it. Shockingly, the company was not a success. The Doge Tip bot website emphasized that the service was always free, yet somehow Mulan believed this creation would support a business model. He tried to get investors, but who would want to invest in the Doge meme tokens with no path to monetization? This week, Mulan suddenly announced to Reddit in a post entitled Important, I'm taking Doge bot, Tip bot to a server farm upstate. That while such business incorporated was bankrupt, the bot was dead, and Mulan had emptied everyone's digital wallet. According to Mulan, 2015, all while such business employees were laid off, including himself, and he began pouring his personal funds into the service to keep the bot alive. With $500 in the bank account, all of my personal funds spent, and all my personal credit cards maxed out to pay for the business, I had to make a case to potential investors as to why cryptocurrency t- tipping wasn't going anywhere and why they should back us, Mulan wrote. After he ran out his own his own money, he made the decision to cash out the cold, cold storage funds, meaning strictly using customer funds and stealing the users' coins in an attempt to keep the dream of cryptocurrency tipping alive. In finance, customer funds are supposed to remain segregated from business funds. They live in a separate legal universe, and this rule was meant to insulate the business and customers from each other's failures. In the wild, stupid west of cryptocurrency, this rule is not always respected, and is why Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and other altcoins suffer from such devastating failures so often. Lure, even though the grifted Doge tip bot users could have a claim in court with while such business goes formally bankrupt, cryptocurrencies exist in a largely unexplored legal limbo, so good luck to them getting a single Dogecoin back. Uh, the Dogecoin attracted the same intersection of government hating. Okay, kind of. That's not the point here. In order to deal with his debt, Mulan decided to completely, completely erase the Dogecoins held by all his tip bot users. As of right now, everyone's tip. Doge tip bot balance is set to zero. The slate is literally white clean. There are no Doge coins left in the tip bot hot wallet. It's literally the nuclear option. 
I'm Lauren wrote his post. I personally hold no crypto course, nor do I have any desire in the future. Have one piece of advice for anyone considering starting a crypto business? Don't. Dogecoin used to be fun back when it wasn't worth anything. We were the coin that made fun of people looking for a quick profit. Over time, we turned every, everything I hate about crypto more on limit. I just don't see it happening since I was in the middle of it. He closed the post with a YouTube link to a video titled Fight Club Ending. In response to Moran's post, many of his company notes shy began thanking him for robbing them blind and desperately trying to cobble together funds to keep the charade going. Moran has since added an option to let, let, to let him keep the Doge coins he already stole or get an IIU for your banished Doge coins. Sometime in the future, he wrote, I'll have to buy them over time when I get paid, so this is, might take a while. Uh, yesterday, Dogecoin's co-founder posted a similar update, yet some loyal shops are even open to openly getting a percentage of the Dogecoins back. Uh, the Doge shops, the Doge tip bot sale is, is also most likely the death keel for Dogecoin in general. The currency has been slowly disintegrated since the Bayboot enthusiast Alex Green, formerly Ryan Green Kennedy, who stole millions of customer funds in another cryptocurrency scam, pushed out the original creators and moderators for Dogecoin in a soft coup to the benefit of his new Dogecoin exchange. Mulan Mula has since declared bankruptcy after a hack. Kennedy has especially been in prison for abusing and raping three women. Now Dogecoin will likely meet the fate of other altcoins such as uh, Titcoin, our Aurora coin, or Namecoin. Uh, the greedy holders have no reason to ever divest, so the currency will kept, be kept alive by the weird true believers in some godforsaken corner of the internet where forgotten botnets and graphic card lines blocks for benefit of no one. Until all the wallet passwords are completely, finally forgotten. This guy's pretty negative. Um... <laughs> So, um, <clears throat> so um, if you had some Doge coins on the tip bot, you can make a claim. Um, I some people are trying to revise it. I, I don't know how the tip bot can be revised, but um, we'll see. Like I said, after we talk about the block size debate, we'll talk about the state of the Doge coin. It just this is a sad state of affairs. I think it really has to do just with a different cultural mindset. It doesn't really meet with the economic realities of how to run or uh, navigate the cryptocurrency space. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.